So sorry, having a little bit of technical difficulty here. We're going to bring you Marketplace, and it's a look at the Internet and the way in which the Internet became a monopoly. It feels like a utility to Americans, and they don't want to give it up. They'll pay for it often before they'll pay for food if they're running out of money. How they provide access at charging well, almost whatever they want. That's next. WNYC supporters include the Folk Project Acoustic Stay Away, live online concerts every Tuesday and Friday at 7 p.m. by acoustic musicians during their COVID isolation. Tonight's concert is by David Jacob Strain. Schedule and more at folkproject.org. WNYC, independent journalism in the public interest. 93.9 FM and AM820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Marketplace is supported by Home Advisor, helping homeowners find the right pros for their home projects. Homeowners can now see upfront pricing, book appointments, and pay for over a hundred projects with the Home Advisor app. Here's the thing about this economy we're living through right now. We'll talk about monthly numbers and weekly numbers and daily numbers, but this economic story will be measured in years. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by Progressive Insurance with the Name Your Price tool, offering a range of coverage and price options to choose from. Now that's Progressive. More at Progressive.com or 1-800-PROGRESSIVE. And by C3.ai. C3.ai software enables organizations to use artificial intelligence at enterprise scale, solving previously unsolvable business problems. Learn more at C3.ai. In Oakland, I'm Molly Wood. It's Friday, July 3rd. Thanks for joining us going into this holiday weekend and headed into this slightly awkward Independence Day. Things are turbulent. We got positive jobs news this week on a potentially significant delay. Cases of COVID-19 continue to rise. You might not even realize it, but lots of Black Lives Matter protests are still happening around the country. And the Hamilton musical has finally arrived on streaming platforms. Let's chat a little bit about the week that was. With me today, we have Gina Smilek at the New York Times and Heather Long from the Washington Post. Hey, you two. Hey, Molly. Hey, Molly. Um, hi there. So I want to start with Gina and this this jobs report with, of course, the caveat you heard at the top, which is that, sure, these are some numbers at a moment in time. Um, 4.8 million jobs were added in June, but there are caveats, right? Absolutely. So 4.8 million jobs is a huge number, but so is 11.1%, which is the unemployment rate still, even after that big gain. What we have right now is a jobless rate that is higher than at any point in the Great Recession. This is higher than the 10% peak we saw at the worst part of 2009. And I think it's really important to keep that in context because what we've seen so far is the easy rehiring. We've seen people who were still attached to their employer come back to jobs as states reopen. But I think the real question is what happens next? And down the road, do these people who are still on the labor market sidelines prove a lot harder to reabsorb into the job market? And I think early signs would suggest yes. You know, we're seeing a shift from short-term to long-term unemployment. So the in unemployment duration is increasing. And we're really seeing a shift from folks who say they're on temporary layoff to folks who say they have permanently lost their jobs. And I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. Right. And Heather, you had a piece this week looking at how even those who are still working, you know, it's one thing to measure the number of jobs. People have fewer hours and lower wages, right? Yeah, that's what surprised me is um, we're seeing twice as many people getting pay cuts this recession as what we saw during that Great Recession. So another indication of how widespread the harm is. And, you know, we're also focused about people who've lost their jobs. And that's we should be focused on that. But there's this whole other array of people who I talk to and I know Gina does, too, who say, look, I'm only working two or three days a week. You know, I'm back 50 percent. I know businesses can't survive on 50% and workers can't survive on 50% of the income that they used to have. So another indication, this is a long road back. And I just keep thinking in my mind, uh, in April, 80% of workers thought that this, they were going to be short-term layoff. So far, we've only gained back a third of the jobs. That's a big gap between what workers 
numbers expected to be back by June or July versus what we're seeing. Right. Well, and and Catherine Rampell, uh, your colleague, Heather, and and a, a rapper, an occasional rapper on this show, also had a piece saying, uh, even knowing what we know now, which may even be itself be on a delay, we're we're headed for an even bigger fiscal cliff as some stimulus runs out, PPP loans run out, uh, and the virus resurges. Gina, what does this mean for this? What does this mean for Congress? and the idea of more aid. Right. So I think there is a real concern, certainly among the economists I talk to and imagine also among the ones Heather is chatting with, that these positive jobs numbers are going to take some of the pressure off of Congress. And I think there are two big reasons that you would worry about that. One is that clearly the damage that we have seen to the economy is persistent. It is still with us. And as the virus continues to spread throughout much of the South and the West, we're even seeing new damage piling up. And and so there's a real need to act just to renew a lot of these measures that are about to expire at the end of July because the problem is still here. B, some of the issues that we have with this recession were just never dealt with in the first place. I think state and local aid is a perfect example. You know, we saw Mm -hmm. in in the CARES Act, we did see some help going to those entities, but it was very limited and it was mostly tied to sort of immediate concerns around fighting the virus. Whereas these, these, you know, governments that have balanced budget amendments haven't had very much tax revenue coming in. They're losing sales tax revenue altogether. And so there is a real crisis upon us if we don't deal with those issues. But we have lost some of the the sort of tailwind behind that effort. Mm-hmm. Heather, the, the Fed, uh, the Fed's minutes were out this week. Chair Powell seems to get this. That's been a constant message from the Federal Reserve is Congress, don't let this backslide. You know, we've seen some mm-hmm. momentum here and don't give it up. And as Gina was explaining, uh, there's still a, clearly a huge need. We've only gained back a third of those jobs. And we know we know by the end of the summer, the rest of the jobs aren't going to be back. We're still going to have millions of people unemployed. And there's a real danger that some of these small businesses that have just barely been making it, they've gotten these grants, these PPP grants. Do we really want to see them go out of business in September or October because we didn't Mm kind of help them a little bit along? So I think that's what's really mind boggling to people. There's also other issues that are popping up. We reported in the Washington Post there is an alarming spike in drug overdoses. There's also Mm -hmm. ongoing child care needs that are really holding back a lot of workers from getting back to work. These need to be addressed too in the next bill. Gina Smilek from the New York Times and Heather Long at the Washington Post. Thanks, you two. Thank you. Thank you. Markets were closed for the 4th of July. We ended on a slightly gloomy note. Well, European stocks and U.S. futures, at least right now, in the same mood. Details when we do the numbers. little bit more buzzkill here, which I hate to do about streaming on Hamilton weekend, but the cost of cord cutting is going up. This week, YouTube TV, Google's live alternative to cable, tacked on another $15 to its monthly bill. It is now almost double what it cost when it first launched a few years ago, and YouTube TV is not the only one raising prices. Marketplace's Jasmine Garst has more on why and why now. YouTube TV now costs 65 bucks. Another virtual TV service, Fubo TV, is raising prices too, by $10 a month, also to $65. Viewers will be getting more to watch. YouTube and Fubo make licensing deals with channels to share their shows. For example, YouTube recently bought broadcast rights to Comedy Central from Viacom CBS. But Viacom CBS sold this as part of a bundle. You want Comedy Central? You have to buy the Smithsonian Channel and Paramount TV. P.K. Kanan studies marketing at the University of Maryland. So when YouTube wants to you know, expand their coverage, then they have to go to these content producers who sell things in bundles, and so their costs go up. 
as do yours, the viewers. Eric Hagstrom with eMarketer says, "We're expecting them to consistently increase prices for this foreseeable future, largely because they've been pricing below cost to try and attract subscribers away from traditional cable and satellite TV." Ironically, YouTube TV is facing the same problem as cable TV, the industry it was trying to disrupt. What started out as slim, cheap packages are now bigger and more expensive, although cheaper than a lot of cable. Still, the question is: Will people now pay more for extra channels they may not want? Hagstrom says, at the end of the day, it comes down to live sports. I think right now we're in a bit of a weird spot, simply because there are no sports on TV, and these services really. Their key feature is that they offer access to live sports. He says until live sports come back, people likely won't be paying extra. I'm Jasmine Garst for Marketplace. Now for the latest in our series, My Economy. Today we hear from one woman whose job it is to connect consumers with brands created by Black women and women of color. And this one comes to us from London, courtesy of the BBC. My name is Janet Ogana. I'm the founder of Janet's List, and what we do is we help people to discover and buy from brands by Black women and women of color from the UK. About two, three years ago, when I had the idea for Janet's List, when I told people about it, the reactions from Black women and women of color were like, "Oh my goodness, this is exactly what I'm looking for. You know, this is well overdue." But when I spoke to other people, particularly people of a business back. Ground who were not black and not people of color, you know, they'd really question it. They're like, you know, is it too niche?、Um, I doubt there'll be enough brands of a certain quality, which is absolutely ridiculous. But what's interesting is the events of the last month really galvanized the Black Lives Matter movement, which obviously has been going on for years and years. But there's definitely I've seen a real interest and engagement with the work that we're doing. So for me, you know, it's completely validated what I've always known. I think fundamentally, access to money and finance is really at the heart of achieving the systemic change and really challenging that systemic racism that we've seen. We're in a situation where less than two percent of venture capitalist funding goes to black women. You know, this is from research in America. So there's a real need for change, and I think money, economics, and finance is at the heart of this. When we had our pop up in Amsterdam in October 2019 for Black History Month, I was sitting across at the shop and I could see this little、uh, mixed race girl with her face, you know, held up against the window, transfixed, looking at the dolls that we had in the display, and there were black dolls, which is something that I imagined that she just hadn't seen, and she was just like, "I've got to get one of these," and obviously her mom bought her one, and she was really excited. Um, and so she skipped out of the shop, and then 20 seconds later, the little girl ran in, and she's like, "Oh, I've got to get one for my best friend too, because you know we both look like the dolls in the window." And honestly, I was just about to cry. <laughs> and you know, in business, you have tough moments, and I always look back at that little girl, and it makes me realize that this is why we're doing it, so that you know, for those that come after us, they can see themselves represented everywhere. Janet Ogana, founder of Janet's List. What a like a remarkable person! Tell us what's going on in your economy at marketplace.org. Coming up. So we expect people slowly, slowly to start traveling. How Europe's getting ready to reopen, even if it's not to American visitors. But first, let's do the numbers. Here in the U.S., of course, markets are closed for the Independence Day holiday. But over in Europe, Britain's FTSE shed 1.3 percent. France's CAC 40 fell eight tenths percent, and Germany's DAX dropped six tenths of a percent. European Union officials today did give early approval for Gilead scientists. 
Sciences, Remdesivir, I like that science was the hard word there, uh, to treat severe COVID cases. The world's biggest pension fund in Japan lost more than $164 billion from January to March. That was a record. Oil prices fell 8 tenths percent to just over $40 a barrel. And you're listening to Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by Personal Capital, offering telefinance options. Personal Capital can help those worried about the market put together a plan. Learn more at personalcapital.com. And by LifeLock, reminding consumers that breached information could be used to commit identity theft. Learn more at lifelock.com slash APM. Support for WNYC comes from GEICO Insurance, celebrating over 75 years of providing auto insurance for drivers across America. GEICO can also help insure motorcycles, RVs, homes, and more. More at geico.com or 1-800-947-AUTO. Next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour, Keenan Thompson. He's the longest-running cast member ever on Saturday Night Live, and it took him years to feel like he belonged. It just never seemed real for so long. Like, I had such a hard time even associating myself being on the show for a long time. Like, I wouldn't watch, you know what I'm saying, just because really? I felt like I was ruining it. Kenan Thompson joins us next time on the New Yorker Radio Hour. Tomorrow morning at 10 on 93.9 FM, WNYC. You're listening to Marketplace on WNYC. Stay tuned for All Things Considered. And then our Friday evening lineup starts at 8 with On the Media and followed by Latino USA on 93.9 FM WNYC. This is Marketplace. I'm Molly Wood. On my regular show, Marketplace Tech, we've been doing a series looking at Internet access, cost, infrastructure, competition, at a time when the Internet is more essential than ever, a utility, you might even say. But according to a 2017 study from the nonprofit Institute for Local Self-Reliance, more than 129 million people in the U.S. only have one option for broadband. That can drive up prices or leave people out of luck if their neighborhood isn't covered. So whose problem is this to solve, government or companies? Susan Crawford is a law professor at Harvard University. She's author of the book Fiber, The Coming Tech Revolution and Why America Might Miss It. Susan, thanks for joining me. Hey, Molly. Thanks for having me. So let's get an idea of of kind of the competitive landscape such as it is. Who are, you know, the major players providing Internet access to people in their homes? A couple different ways to tell that story. There are basically five major providers in the United States, Comcast, Charter, Verizon, AT&T, and CenturyLink. But actually, the one bright spot in the American economy right now may be the cable industry. So mm -hmm. Comcast and Charter have about 70 million of the 102 million uh, subscriptions in the United States, and they're pulling away. They had their best quarter, last quarter, since 2007. Hmm. Um, <laughs> I like how you say that as in that double edged sword kind of tone, um, because it, I mean, they're big and getting bigger, which has been kind of the story of telecom in America, right? That's right. Without oversight or competition, we've allowed a handful of players to really control our Internet access destiny. And it's particularly cruel right now. About 18 percent of African-American households in America don't have a connection at home. And many times that's because of cost. There may be that cable provider there, but they're a local monopoly. If you're in L.A. or New York, uh, you're definitely charter. If you're in Philadelphia or Denver, your only choice is Comcast, and they can charge whatever they like. I mean, it, it's partly regulation, it sounds like, right? But Or yeah. rather, lack of regulation. But the mm -hmm. infrastructure is also incredibly expensive to deploy. Like, what are the biggest barriers to equalizing this access? Well... The country managed this for electricity and telephone, but somehow we've fallen apart when it comes to Internet access. It is very expensive to roll out these networks all the way to houses. Eighty percent of that cost is uh, labor. And uh, what's happened is the phone companies, Verizon and AT&T, have pretty much backed away from competing head to head with Comcast and Charter when it comes to lines into houses. So that has left people in their homes and businesses relying on the infrastructure of the cable companies and paying through the nose. Would this landscape change? There's a, there's been a lot of conversation about classifying Internet as a utility. It seems that, you know, it's pretty easy to argue that Internet 
access in practice is in fact a utility as in it is necessary for uh, modern <laughs> life. Um, but would a legal classification ameliorate some of these problems? It would certainly be a step. Look, when you go get a driver's license, you can bring your cable bill as evidence of your address. It feels like a utility to Americans, and they don't want to give it up. They'll pay for it often before they'll pay for food if they're running out of money. Legal classification would be a first step towards ensuring uh, that these networks are forced to compete, but it would run headlong into an awful lot of litigation. And I've actually pushed in my career for just avoiding these guys and building around them. Just make sure that there's a publicly owned uh, basic facility like the open road across which many competitors can travel. And that that basic facility is available at low prices to many members of the private market who want to compete. I'm not saying that the government should be selling internet access to Americans. That doesn't make sense to me. But just as we have a highway system that allows for a lot of trucks to travel over it, so too we should have this basic federal leased infrastructure in place so that everybody can get a cheap connection from a private provider. Susan Crawford is a law professor at Harvard and the author of the book Fiber, The Coming Tech Revolution and Why America Might Miss It. Thanks for talking with me. Thank you. You can find the rest of that series, including stories about how race and poverty affect broadband investment and stories from our listeners about how they get online or don't over at marketplace.org slash internet. Let's be real. Lots of people in this country could use a vacation, and it is a really tough time to try to plan one. States and counties that have opened may be closing again. Rules about mask wearing are different and differently enforced, depending on where you go. And, of course, the number of new COVID-19 cases basically hits a new record every day. And summer vacation spending, which is both a release and a huge economic driver, is in limbo. Marketplace's Mitchell Hartman has more on summer travel. For many Americans, vacation will be stay at home or at least stay close to home this summer. Jeanette Casolano at AAA predicts travel will decline 15 percent from last year. Air, cruise, bus and rail have really been decimated. They're down 75 to 85 percent. What's hardly down at all is road tripping. Castellano says people are waiting till the last minute to decide based on COVID-19 numbers, beach openings and the like. It helps that gas is cheap. People are really turning to their own personal vehicles or rental vehicles. And that's because car provides so much flexibility. Some people are still flying, mostly to see friends or family or for love. Sarah Sumner is 27, a yoga teacher living in Brooklyn. I met someone online and was like, oh my goodness, I need to meet them in person. So I ended up flying to Portland. Her flights in May and June were good, she says. So they had taken out the middle seat. Everybody was really waiting and being cautious and wanting to not only observe masks, but also having social distancing. And her new romance? Well, she's planning another trip later this summer. But more airlines are trying to sell those middle seats, reducing the distance between passengers. Analyst Peter McNally at Third Bridge. For example, like American needs on some routes, like 75 percent load factors to be profitable. In that case, you're probably going to see middle seats being used. And summer travel decisions keep getting more complicated. With COVID-19 resurging in the South and West, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut have now ordered 14-day quarantines for some out-of-state travelers. I'm Mitchell Hartman for Marketplace. So obviously, none of us will be visiting Britain anytime immediately, but the country is reopening some of its vacation attractions. Museums across Britain can open as of tomorrow as lockdown restrictions ease across that country. But will they? Because being allowed to open and actually opening are not quite the same thing. The BBC's Elizabeth Hudson brings us this story. It's uncharacteristically quiet here in London. And around the world, COVID-19 is taking a huge toll on galleries and museums. 
The United Nations cultural organisation, UNESCO, has warned that with the loss of ticket revenue and some sponsorship, around 10% of museums globally will never reopen. At Fishbourne Roman Palace in the south of England, without any visitors, they're feeling the financial squeeze. Normally across the whole organisation, we welcome 160,000 visitors per year. Obviously, the close down happened during our high season, which is why we've lost a million pounds in revenue. That's property manager Melanie Marsh. This 2000 year old site with stunning Roman mosaics makes its money from the cafe shop and admissions charges and it'll struggle to handle the lost revenue. We don't automatically get money from government bodies or other organisations, so it's highly unlikely we will be able to recoup that cost. There are a few chinks of light, though, in what is a very dark time for museums. One of these is the huge number of eyes on screens over lockdown. In stark terms, attractions with a strong online presence could be better placed to survive. Bernard Donoghue is director of the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions in the UK. So the hundreds of thousands of people who have gone online to go on virtual tours of museums and galleries and download recipes and printable jigsaws has been absolutely enormous. It does prove that there is an appetite and there's a public and there's a market out there and we just need to be better at inviting people to cross the threshold. One attraction which has reopened and is enthusiastically inviting people back across the threshold is the Ateneum. It's Finland's best-known art museum and director Maria Sakari spoke to me from the museum's very vibrant sounding bistro. Finnish people of course they are cautious but then they are not too much afraid. After restrictions were taken away people started to go to the restaurants and also slowly slowly to museums. The Ateneum is in the fortunate position of receiving some government funding and being surrounded by countries which have been coming out of lockdown, both of which may partly explain her air of quiet optimism as international visitors start returning. Some countries have opened their frontiers, like the Baltic countries and also Norway, Denmark uh, and so on. So we expect people slowly, slowly to start travelling. And as more cities emerge from lockdown, we'll see whether that kind of optimism is justified. In London, I'm the BBC's Elizabeth Hodgson for Marketplace. This final note on the way out today is about fireworks. I know we are kind of sick of hearing about fireworks. Plenty of people are sick of hearing fireworks. But think of the fireworks sellers who actually expected total disaster this summer. No baseball games, park events, 4th of July celebrations. But actually, they're having a great summer. Personal fireworks consumption is up 115%. It's a little silver lining there for some business owners. And for those of you who just don't care and want it all to stop, well, there's good news for you too. Retailers say there is about to be a major shortage As of about July 5th, in fact, America is pretty much sold out of fireworks. Marketplace is supported by Noom, a personalized program based in psychology to help people understand their motivations, change their habits, and lead healthier lives. Learn more at Noom, N-O-O-M dot com. And by Raymond James, tailored wealth management, banking, and capital market solutions for clients' unique needs. Learn more at RaymondJames.com. All right, we're out of here. Our theme music was composed by B.J. Lederman, Marketplace's executive producer is Nancy Fergali. Nancy Cassett is the managing director of news, and Deborah Clark is the senior vice president and general manager. I am Molly Wood. Have a good holiday weekend, everyone. We'll be back on Monday. This is APM.